Okay, so uh, we're very pleased to uh, have our Charles H. Frank Memorial Speaker today, Robert James Fine, the Executive Director of the IVRHA. He'll have to tell us what that acronym means. And my apologies for an incorrect uh, uh, announcement on the title. The correct title is the next next cyber warfare AR and VR worlds. So let me now introduce uh, Dr. Fine, and uh, he can take it from here. Thank you very well, much. Well, thank thank you very much, Dr. Masterson, for for introducing me and and having and inviting me for this um, uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, I uh, actually I'm I'm big fan of Seton Hall. Uh, I I went to Villanova as an undergrad, so always look forward to uh, the Big East uh, basketball games with Seton Hall. And uh, and my brother-in-law uh, actually is graduate from Seton Hall from a uh, seminary there. Um, and apologize for for maybe some some confusion regarding the the title. And and I'll get into this in a second. Um, you know, my I, I started my own business back in 2009 and was really a content publisher for for almost uh, seven eight years. But then back in uh, in 2018, uh, started a, an association for the VR and healthcare industry, which is you know 90% of my focus today, and that that's where the the IVR comes from, as the International uh, Virtual Reality and Healthcare Association. Um, but I started making this presentation uh, back in uh, in 2018, four years ago, um, in the uh, in the early days of, of VR conferences, and I'll, I'll but I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. So a little bit about me. Uh, my background is is 20 years, well, 25 years now of engineering and IT. I just turned 50 uh, two weeks ago. Hate to say that. Um, and uh, and I, I went to Villanova uh, undergrad for mechanical engineering. Um, and uh, but I've been um, all my IT is kind of self-taught from uh, going back to a Commodore VIC 20 when I was nine. Uh, and I spent the first half of my career in uh, telecom and wireless. Um, actually learned RF engineering uh, on the job, uh, a little bit of <clears throat> black magic there, and uh, and was very lucky right out of school to to be working uh, internationally. So a lot of my work has had a a very strong overseas component. And uh, and even when I was uh, in those early days, I, I graduated back in '94. Uh, I started a, a hobby site, which uh, and maybe some of you might be familiar with with uh, WAP wireless access protocol. This was really first generation websites on cell phones, and uh, and I was a little bit ahead of the market. Uh, this was like five years before the iPhone came out, uh, but it was a, a website that I started just once, you know, publishing once a day, uh, article reviews of of websites on cell phones, and it. It kind of blossomed into a, a big uh, website, and uh, we got our content on some carriers' phones, uh, Sprint back in the day, and uh, FidoNet in Canada, which I, I don't think exists any longer. Uh, and then um, I uh, had always had a strong uh, interest in environmental science uh, growing up. Um, ended up doing a master's in environmental science and policy uh, part time. Uh, at Johns Hopkins, uh, and then, uh, and I'm, I'm unfortunately, I'm uh, ABD uh, in environmental science and policy from George Mason, um, and uh, for me it was very complicated. Actually, my my chair was from the comp sci department, um, and it was a mixed uh, background because I I have such a kind of a diverse background academically. It was very hard to kind of fit me uh, into where uh, which department to work best. Uh, and then I got a, a dream job in uh, 2000 uh, with a large conservation nonprofit here in Washington called Conservation International, and their roots are out of the Nature Conservancy. I was hired as a global director of IT, and I had the privilege um, of uh, my my job was to uh, connect all of our field offices to high speed internet any way we could. So that was uh, whether it was microwave or VSAT. Uh, or DSL or cable um, 
or Wi-Fi, uh, whatever was economical. And this was in a lot of uh, developing countries um, such as Madagascar, uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, Liberia, um, and uh, build an international team of 25 staff. And, uh, you know, more than enough travel for a couple of lifetimes, but, uh, you know, built, built it out in 40 countries and uh, was, a, you know, really a, a great part of my career. And then I started uh, my own media company. I've done IT consulting on and off on my own, you know, throughout my career. Uh, but I actually, uh, I, I found myself laid off for the first time uh, in my career the day uh, after my 38th birthday. And this was um, April of 2009 at the height of the last downturn, which we can refer back to now. And uh, very much from my happenstance though, um, I was getting, uh, back in 2008, 2009, I was quickly getting very interested in Twitter and Facebook. Uh, Twitter had just become a little bit mainstream after the uh, first 08 uh, Obama election. And a couple of weeks after being laid off, I ended up organizing what turned out to be the first uh, conference about social media on the East Coast uh, here in Washington. And uh, it got some uh, great national press coverage. Uh, PBS NewsHour filmed a, a 20 minute piece uh, that aired later in the summer. And, and the title of the, that piece was, you know, along the lines of Twitter, is it, is it a fad or is it here to stay? And it, it's it's so hard to just think about, uh, you know, more than 10 years ago when social media was really in its infancy and, and just catching people's imagination. And today it's now uh, a part of our fabric and uh, and we can't get away from it, <laughs> even if we want to. Um, and uh, so I did a bunch of, I did about 20 conferences that year on my own across the US and Canada and one in Dubai. And, uh, and then I uh, had a book come out in uh, 2010 called the big book of social media case studies which is uh, there in that lower left corner and very much to my surprise you get by, got picked up as a textbook uh, at about 10 universities um, and so based on that i was kind of looking for a niche on what to do next and um, i i did what nobody you know really should in their right mind do and i launched the only print magazine about social media um, so this was in uh, the summer of uh, 2011. Um, this is at the beginning as, of, of print going downhill uh, as a medium, uh, but I was a big fan of print always. Um, I still am. I think it's a great medium. Um, I, for me, it's, it's still not as comfortable to read a newspaper or, uh, or a magazine, you know, on a tablet or, uh, or online. And I, I really, I still, prefer that visceral feeling of a physical, you know, print product. Excuse me. And um, and magazine did really well. Um, three weeks after after launching, we got um, national distribution in Barnes and Noble, and uh, uh, was in twenty countries uh, uh, with distribution. We were named one of the fifteen hottest magazine launches of twenty eleven. And uh, so this is leading into, you know, getting into the virtual reality side of things. Um, back in 2016, uh, shortly after the Oculus Kickstarter came out, uh, and then they, they were very quickly bought by Facebook uh, for $2 billion, uh, people started talking about social VR as an early application. And um, this is where uh, I started looking at it uh, from the, the viewpoint of social media digital marketing. Um, I'm a longtime video gamer though as well, and so I've always kept an eye on VR, you know, particularly from a gaming aspect. And um, and so in 2017, 2016 and 17, I was experimenting, doing different one-off events in different verticals in VR, and just trying to see where the interest was. And so we experimented and did VR and architecture, VR and defense, VR and higher education. Uh, but we did our first VR and healthcare event in uh, 2017, uh, five years ago now, um, and that was a good success. And uh, we did a follow-up at Harvard Medical School that that did very well. And so 2018, I, I've decided to focus on uh, building an association for the VR and healthcare industry. 
Um, and today we have close to 100 organizations uh, involving uh, startups, uh, uh, universities, uh, teaching medical schools, and uh, different research associations. Um, still, uh, in addition to this, um, you know, going back to the early days of the magazine and uh, and websites, you know, we've been I still maintain these websites around focused on social media uh, and um, uh, and started an early uh, VR website uh, called VR Voice back in 2016 as well. Uh, but between these, you know, have a have a large number of articles, and and this is still a little bit of a of a side business to the uh, to the association. So let's get into this. So <clears throat> this is a lot of prediction now, and believe it or not, so again, putting this a little bit into perspective from a time standpoint, um, I've been doing this presentation since 2018 and talking about. Uh, you know, the potential implications of cybersecurity with VR. Um, these headlines are all from the last four weeks. <laughs> um, Epic Games, you may have heard, raised a billion dollars from uh, with a great deal from Sony to build the metaverse. Uh, NVIDIA has come out and they are building their own metaverse um, with digital twins of, of the world as we are in today. Uh, Roblox went public uh, not too long ago, earlier this year, $38 billion valuation. They're building their version of the metaverse. Uh, and there are trillions, I, I don't know if it's trillions today, I think we're going to be getting into trillions, but there's definitely a couple hundred million, um, you know, close to maybe billion, two billion in cash that's been invested in the last couple of years uh, in the various companies, including Epic, NVIDIA and so forth, into um, thinking about, you know, this metaverse and, and how do we build it and what version do we build? And it's it's good to see that um, as recently as, as two weeks ago, uh, that people are starting to think about um, you know, what are the implications of, of the metaverse and, you know, do we need a zoning board? Um, I didn't even think about the idea of conflicts between virtual neighbors or virtual worlds for that matter. And uh, we've all been on Zoom um, and GoToMeeting and Microsoft Teams for the last 12 plus months. I think we're all quite tired of it. Um, are we ready though for a metaverse and to spend uh, you know that time in a 3D world? I, I I think a lot of us are. I mean, I think this this whole last year, you know, trying to imagine if if VR was a little farther along than it is today, um, what would have this last year during the pandemic looked like of us working in VR? Um, a lot everything's been moved online. Lots of meetings online. Um, and but you know we're we're still so early that even doing a conference um, or a virtual classroom for that matter in VR is not quite ready for prime time yet. There's still a, a cost factor due to the cost of hardware, um, teachers getting up to speed on how to even just teach in VR and present content, uh, and then students having the headsets available to participate. So right now. You know, we are kind of in this this rosy view of VR, AR, and MR. Um, you know, the Oculus Quest 2 is doing very well. Um, it's great to see that. We've got some other headsets on the market from HTC. Um, HP has their Reverb 2 product uh, out. They're coming out with a new headset at the end of this month for being able to collect biometric data, which is going to be great from a healthcare perspective. Um, but you know, as as with any you know large platform, any large system, whether it's you know the Usenet, whether it's HN, whether it's Reddit, um, you know, there's there's always ne you know nefarious things lurking you know underneath, and you can't get away from that uh, when you have any large you know number of users involved in any platform. <clears throat> So what do we have to worry about, you know, with virtual reality and the metaverse in particular? Um, but I think the question we have to be asking is, is who do we have to worry about? Um, and more specifically, whom uh, do we have to worry about? 
do we have to worry about this guy? Um, the the classic uh, hacker of of you know war games twenty years ago or uh, anonymous five years ago or whatever hacker group is is you know the, of the du jour the, today. Or do we have to worry about China, um, which I do think we have to worry about, uh, and uh, it's already been clear that. Uh, they've made great inroads into hacking. Uh, North Korea has gotten a lot of uh, attention with their uh, hacking as of late. Um, Iran, you know, maybe to a little bit lesser extent, but still a concern. Or do we have to worry about these guys? Um, and maybe, maybe we let these guys represent, you know, the complete unknown factor for the moment. Or most worryingly, do we need to worry about this guy? Um, and unfortunately, we still do. It's it's amazing to you know that the man has still been in, in power for 20 years and still going on, uh, and you know had a huge you know impact in the 2016 election. So, you know, what concerns should we be thinking about in terms of cybersecurity in VR and AR? And and I think. Uh, you know, this is cybersecurity, whether it's it's uh, in traditional networks, um, mobile phones, or any relatively new platform uh, is always an afterthought. Uh, it always kind of comes at the end, and very, very few people think about uh, security early on. Um, I think that's starting to change, um, and more, you know, just because of the, due to the fact that uh, we've had so many hacks, uh, you can't go you know, without a day going by of uh, a new um, breach uh, being met, you know, and people's personal data being being uh, sold online. So <clears throat> do we need to worry about illegal recording, theft of user behavioral data? Um, this is a, a very high concern in the healthcare space, you know, where I'm working every day. You know, do we need to worry about ransomware attacks in VR and AR? Obviously, there's a, a, an issue uh, today within uh, traditional networks, um, and for whatever reason, hospitals um, seem to get get hit uh, very often. Um, we saw the the city of Baltimore get hit, uh, I think, about last year, uh, and uh, and Atlanta uh, as well. So it's just becoming, uh, you know, more of a difficult issue every day. And you know, do we worry about how users might be misled uh, in phishing attacks? What was a phishing attack in VR, AR look like necessarily? And are people going to give up, you know, personal information and and potentially credit card information as, as happens occasionally today? So, you know, things that are starting to be con concerned about today as VR gets deployed, um, are devices, you know, being taken remotely in the workplace? Are they being taken over remotely from the workplace or from home if you're using it at home? And, you know, can people hack in as easily into a VR device as any other IP addressed device? And I think what what is very worrying um, is you know, what happens if this occurs during uh, critical maneuvers, depending on the industry, whether it's in defense, whether it's particularly in medicine. Uh, and uh, do we th think about, you know, avatar impersonations? Uh, uh, Oculus just came out with a new version of their avatars, um, still kind of cartoonish looking, which is fine, um, but we've already seen plenty of, of examples of very uh, real looking avatars um, and, uh, you know, making it intent more harder every day to tell from what's real and from what's uh, designed. And do we need to worry about who we're interacting with? Um, do we know who we're interacting with and are the people presenting themselves uh, you know, truly who they say they are, or are we dealing with people that we wouldn't know otherwise? And so I, I share this um, 
uh, you know, little South Park cartoon, because uh, is this what, you know, the evening news might look like in a couple more years? Will we will it be presented not by this gentleman, but by an avatar that we necessarily can't tell the difference from our uh, our current evening news anchor as it is today? And so is this what the future looks like? And is this the news that we can trust? Um, you know, well, I mean, we've we've just lived through four years of fake news uh, and the the um, the pushing of fake news, and and you know, the media does have a lot to to play on uh, how they uh, cover things unbiasedly or not. But uh, this is something that that now is part of our psyche, and we you know whether we think about it. Uh, consciously or not, it's now always there. And, you know, do we worry about the next Cambridge Analytics uh, on steroids? Um, who we can, you know, blame uh, Mr. Zuckerberg uh, quite a bit for. So I think what's what's interesting as well is we're this is very early um, research looks at uh, cyber attacks within the metaverse and uh, uh, Casey et al have even gone so far as to try to define uh, what an attack might look like in the metaverse um, the chaperone attack um, any attack that modifies your virtual environmental boundaries. So the VR walls that are put on uh, from the headset. A disorientation attack, uh, any attack that elicits more dizziness, uh, more nausea, more confusion uh, for an immersed VR user. Um, uh, dizziness and nausea are still an issue for many people. It, it's decreasing over time uh, as ref refresh rates increase, um, but What's unique about this from, say, a nor hacker attack in a traditional network is this is causing now potentially a physical harm. Um, you know, I don't think we have to worry so much about uh, the physical harm of uh, uh, dizziness, you know, but maybe induced vomiting is something that none of us really want. Um, I think this is a real issue overlay attack. I mean, this is not. Uh, necessarily new to uh, to uh, normal networks today, but you know, unseen unwanted images being provided uh, and displayed within a, a viewers um, uh, view shot within VR. And then, uh, you know, the, the one name I like, you know, the most the human joystick attack. Um, and uh, I think this is this is a little bit of a reach, but you know, within a uh, a large virtual environment uh, could be a gaming environment uh, and uh, location based entertainment. You know, could an actor, you know, take over um, a person's headset or and and drive them in a direction where, you know, they fall down a flight of stairs uh, or they knock themselves into a wall um, again, you know, something that can have a, a physical impact. Um, beyond uh, just uh, you know data being taken or your laptop being um, overrun. So, you know when we when we look back at at the early days of the web and we think about um, and this is still the way things work very much today in, in terms of hyperlinked information, um, the entire web and, and net has been built on this very simple uh, premise. Um, does the future of the metaverse, you know, look like that? And as we kind of talked about earlier, we might have multiple metaverses, you know, multiple universes, if you will. Um, and uh, I think this is what, you know, the future is very well going to look like. We, you know, these worlds will be hyperlinked. Um, the VR environments of different universities might be hyperlinked with each other. Why wouldn't they be? Why wouldn't you be able to traverse from the VR environment of your school library into the you know school library VR environment of uh, of Villanova University as you're doing research. Um, obviously, not quite doing this today, but I can see this you know in the next three, four, or five years. 
So whether it's you know AR or VR um, or whichever acronym you want to call it today, um, how do we know when it's going to be safe be to traverse between these worlds or between these metaverses? And you know this these ideas aren't are are you know a little bit uh, stale, but it's really more from a visualization standpoint just to think about. And so if we think about this is metaverse one, metaverse A, world A that we're in, and we're going to travel to metaverse world B, uh, we're going to travel through some kind of connection, might be an instantaneous connection. Some people have talked about, you know, the idea of wormhole connections, but this is just representative of that migration from one world to the next. Um, and those are actual pepperoni slices. So this is world B or world version two, metaverse world two that I'm in. You know, this this could represent um, the VR world of the university of uh, uh, enterprise company A, Google, Facebook, Apple. It doesn't matter. In in the headset, how do we know if we're in a safe environment within a normal within you know web browser? Uh, we have different visual identifications. We have different messages coming up to warn us if we're not in a safe website or if we're in a hacked website. Um, do the you know one option might be that the the outer edges of our headset you know glow green, indicating it's a safe uh, environment. Maybe it glows red to indicate you know, a troublesome environment or one that we need to be uh, cognizant or aware of. Uh, do we need to click on another button accepting the risk to move forward into this universe metaverse? Uh, it could be as simple as today in the web browser, if you don't have a secure SSL connection, uh, you, you have it unlocked uh, lock uh, as digitally represented. Do the same thing within the headset uh, in a in a you know small area you know but within eyes view or peripheral vision that you know you're in a safe environment or not. So as we move forward and we think about different ways that we can implement cybersecurity. Uh, in VR and AR, I think you know some of these ideas are taken from traditional uh, cybersecurity management within uh, networks today. Um, is there a way we can ensure secure messaging between VR and AR devices, uh, whether it's a, a teleconference or uh, text messaging or audio messaging? Do we have some kind of authentication? Um, do we have a method for ensuring uh, my identity uh, or the identity of the person that I'm talking to. Uh, how do how you know as we start talking to both uh, avatars representing real people, but avatars also representing uh, machine systems? How do we how do we know that we're talking to the right intended uh, avatar? Am I am I talking to Citibank's avatar that says it's from Citibank? Or am I talking to an actor that's looking to, uh, you know, steal uh, a uh, check to uh, check deposit number uh, for other means? And how do we secure the firmware uh, on our devices? Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Oculus uh, ended up bricking um, an entire you know set of Oculus devices when they. Uh, send out a firmware update. Um, how do we make sure that you know that firmware isn't replaced with uh, a third party's firmware? And then it's also validation uh, and integrity of content. Um, do we need to validate you know a metaverse? Uh, do we need to validate a store that's represented in the metaverse that it's it's uh, it's the Walmart that says it's presenting Walmart, or is it representing? Uh, once you get into it, uh, you find items that are have been stolen that are for sale, but maybe you don't know the difference. 
is there are there manners to implement tamper detection? Um, you know, especially in the medical setting, how do we ensure that uh, headsets haven't been tampered with, um, whether you know physically or remotely? And again, just like with SSL today in a browser, can we force authentication between devices? I, I think I think we can. I think that. Uh, the uh, architecture is there to do that, but uh, not many people are thinking about this today, which is great, you know, uh, door for opportunity though in uh, in cybersecurity development. Um, and can we monitor abnormal behavior of a of a device, um, an application, or the ecosystem? Can we make sure that that the metaverse that's being presented to us by Epic uh, isn't being uh, tampered with, or that we're you know, being provided with the, the one and true Epic Metaverse and not a duplication of that. But it's not all bad. Uh, and I think uh, as you're, you know, moving on to professional careers, um, and I'd be very curious to hear your own thoughts uh, on this, but, you know, from a, a recent survey, 75% uh, of uh, respondents said they would welcome the use of VR tools for uh, in their cybersecurity careers. They get more enjoyment out of using uh, VR uh, as opposed to computer based tools. Uh, there's a great company. I can't think of the name off the top of my head, but they've actually developed a really interesting method of uh, doing uh, code troubleshooting um, by representing the file structure in a VR environment and being able to work between programmers, look through the file structure, find a particular file, look at the code, um, but view the, the file structure in a much more holistic 3D manner and seeing the interconnections between file A and file B and how data is being sent back and forth. And many people feel VR will, will increase their ease of use as well as efficiency. So that is, uh, that's the talk I have today. Um, and uh, I uh, welcome anybody to get in touch with me if they like, uh, and you know, more than happy to uh, answer questions or have a discussion at this stage. All right, thank, thank you so much. You so much. I'm, I'm going, going to, to uh, moderate, moderate the questions, the questions here. here. So, so uh, Dr. Marlowe, Dr. Marlowe, Marlowe, I see you have, you a, have a, your hands up. up. Would you feel free to unmute your mic. Echo. I'm sorry? sorry? You have an echo. You have a device. I think um, that yeah. might be because I have feedback from, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, can, okay. Uh, so the question is, or the point is, <clears throat> one of the things I thought of when you said, whom do we have to worry about was to take the opposite sense. That one of the people, one of the things that we have to worry about is accessibility, particularly in healthcare and educational environments. So we have to provide accessible portals for people who have visual hearing and other problems, or as I do, problems with animations or film. And once you do, you're opening up new portals, new points of vulnerability as well. Um, Tara, I'm sorry, I, I, I was unable to hear. I, I, it was barely audible. Were you, are you able to relay that? I'll try again. Turn it off. Okay, so when you said. Uh, can, can you raise the top volume, Tom? We can't hear you. I just did, John. Okay, okay thanks. Okay. Once you talk, when you talked about whom do we have to worry about, I took the opposite interpretation and thought about accessibility. But once you prepare accessible portals and you're going to need them in healthcare and educational environments, you're opening up new points of vulnerability as well. Most definitely. And when you talk about accessibility, um, are you talking about um, 
accessibility from a, a socioeconomic standpoint or just accessibility for general population access to headsets? No, I'm talking about handicaps. Yeah, okay. Visual, oral, yeah. animation. I have problems watching movies and it doesn't even have anything to do with the refresh rate. I could be ill for a weekend. Right, right. I think, yeah, there are some people are, are thinking about accessibility again, just like cybersecurity, it's kind of an afterthought for most. Um, and uh, but there actually are some great groups um, within uh, uh, you know, a number of organizations you know, focused on accessibility issues. And the problem is, the problem are. is you have to do the two of them at the same time. I, I completely agree. Well, if, if for if you're if you're a good developer, you think about you know cybersecurity at the beginning and not at the end. Well, yes, but <laughs> okay. All right. Any other questions? Of, of the of the of the audience are a number focused on cybersecurity issues or or um, looking at that as as career direction. I actually see that. Um, uh, I, I'm not familiar with your name, but um, Elvin has a question. If you'd want to unmute your mic and ask our speaker the question, that would be awesome. Uh, sure. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, I hear you great. No, oh, good, good, good. Uh, I'm a professor in the finance department in uh, the business school, uh, but the question had to do with you. You were you didn't speak to augmented reality quite as much as uh, virtual. Uh, did you see similar? Do you see that augmented is further behind and therefore VR would tend to be in front? Or do you or do you think that the augmented um, uh, might just take an entirely different path. Well, I th I think um, I think the cybersecurity issues um, are the same, whether it's virtual reality or augmented reality, or however you want to define mixed reality. Um, I, you know, a couple of years ago, I had to make a decision uh, because we were going through these terminology changes very quickly, and um, and then people put out XR you know, as the, uh, you know, to represent everything, extended reality. Mm. And, and that's an okay term. Um, the problem though is, is when you have to try to, how do you explain XR to a lay person? Well, you know, if in order to explain XR, then you have to explain VR, AR, MR, all under that. And I've, you know, in terms of, you know, when we when we talk about our, the, our website, VR Voice or, or the association, uh, IVRA, um, I made a decision a while back that that virtual reality is the term that I think you know, for good or for bad, most of the population, all the media, press are most familiar with, and are going to continue to refer to it in that manner as an umbrella, you know, method. Uh, augmented reality. I mean, we'll we'll see if that becomes a uh, a known term or not, you know, among everyday people. Um, but you know, the ten and and. In, in parallel, 10 years ago, when social media was new and hitting the scene, people were saying, oh, it's not going to be called social media 10 years from now. It'll, it'll just be called social or this or that. But that's still kind of the term that's that stuck. So along the same lines uh, in the uh, you were headset uh, centric, there's a number of um, other biometric interfaces that are now um, seem to be in the research and development stages uh, that could extend our uh, physicality uh, into the digital world or the digital world into our physicality, depending on which way you want the data to flow. Uh, but the have you uh, clearly the security issues are going to be the same, if not more dramatic. But is uh, do you think that hospitals and our healthcare is ready for that kind of uh, 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 more digitized interfaces. That's a well. That's a great question, and and it's one you know, working. I'm I'm relatively new to healthcare. Don't don't come from okay. that space traditionally. But I've been working in it for five years now, and and uh, but it's almost the same. It, 
if you think about all, all of a sudden in the last year, healthcare discovered telemedicine. You know, we've all discovered video conferencing in the last 18 months, but video conferencing has been a very usable and great application for 20, 25 years, um, just not being utilized. And, uh, you know, and unfortunately, healthcare is a very, very slow traditionally, um, you know, industry to change. It doesn't like change. Um, telemedicine was almost forced, you know, alternative, you know, because there were no other options. Um, there's great interest in VR um, and and there are heads, you know, when you say talk about biometrics, there's a couple aspects to that. There's one is, um, you know, collection of uh, uh, health biometrics, heartbeat, um, facial movements, uh, eye direction, um, what have you, temperature, I mean, multitude. And then there's the, the uh, a whole area within VR called haptics, where um, you, you're, you're wearing a glove um, and you have tactile um, uh, feel for objects that, you know, that aren't there, but you're, you're getting that input in a variety, you know, could be electrical stimulant. Um, some, some platforms are using um, air pressure. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, the, the haptics is still, is, is still really early. There's actually not even a, uh, much of a mainstream product out there yet. Yeah. Um, and uh, they're, they're coming, but they're, they're, they're a little bit slow, but then, uh, but the, uh, and then, you know, we're going back to uh, gentleman's question, you're, you know, bringing up accessibility. I mean, you know, the ability for VR and, and haptics joined together opens up a whole new world for people with disabilities and accessibility issues to participate in virtual classrooms, in virtual games. Um, uh, and there's and there's even experimentation going on within, you know, uh, that aspect within hospitals or um, application called Playground VR which allows children in pediatric units in different hospitals participate in VR and play a game with each other, um, you know, while they're stuck in their in their in their room. Um, so it's uh, it, it's just it, the stuff that's going on is amazing, um, but it's uh, it, it's moving in at different rates depending on who you're talking to and which institution you're at. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, Bob, I have a question. Um, these headsets handle the case of people who have either partial impairments, like partial visual impairment or partial auditory impairments, or you know things of the sort, uh, or may have just one working ear or one working eye, or you know, like in my case, I don't have binocular vision, even though I have vision in both eyes. How do the how is this progressing? Is is that something that that's a non-issue, or is that an issue with how these headsets work? I, I well, I think that's definitely an issue. Um, and you know, frankly, actually, I don't think anyone is thinking about uh, the use of VR for people with um, impaired vision. Um, it's it's being utilized, and and there's and it's being uh, developed in order to identify impaired vision, and you know. Uh, find ways, but not necessary to. I'm not quite actually sure how you how how VR might be able to be utilized well with uh, with viewing from one eye because then you don't have that stereoscopic view. Um, from an auditory standpoint, um, I think there's this, the same issues are are you know in terms of using voice with VR or any other you know traditional um, PC and and microphone are the same there, um, but. Uh, there's a there's a gentleman in the UK that's actually using VR to help uh, treat uh, people with a stutter um, issue, um, and so there, there's some great experiment being used to to utilize and leverage VR for treating ailments, but not necessarily for replacing um, uh, an ailment or or dealing with disabilities. And I I think that's uh, unfortunately uh, something that's you know, just with traditional PCs is going to come later. Unfortunately, just to follow up, that's going to be a serious problem if we go to VR as the standard platform for delivering educational services. 
I, I, I agree. I think, you know, for, I think for, for VR becoming a, a standard platform, it, that's probably going to be a good 20 years. Um, you, you know, I, and when I talk to people about, you know, what is it going to take for VR to uh, infiltrate um, uh, medicine, it, you know, honestly, for startups, for, for companies in the space, it's a 5, 10, 15 year journey. Um, not because the technology isn't there or the applications aren't ready, but because of the the inertia of of getting healthcare to adopt it uh, and start utilizing it. It's just just to, and and healthcare is a, I mean, what makes it both a, a a great space to work in, but also so challenging is, I mean, healthcare is twenty percent of the U.S. economy. Um, we we today you still have to assume, and it's a very safe assumption that ninety nine percent of the healthcare population, and for that matter, the U.S. population, has not even tried VR yet. Um, you know, we still have, it, it's it's so in its infancy and access to a headset due to cost, um, and, uh, and, and using a headset is not at all easy from a technical standpoint. I mean, you know, even for technical files, you know, getting, getting your quest up and running, um, you know, is not trivial. Um, and so, if we want more of a mainstream population using it, we definitely have to make it, you know, reduce the friction on 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 use, usability and learning of it to pick up and play. Thumbs up from Dr. Marlowe. Um, okay. I wasn't sure if uh, Bob was able to see your thumbs up, so I wanted to make sure that he knew that you gave him the thumbs up. Um, there you go. Um, all right. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Bob. Oh, Tara, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's, it's been a, a pleasure. I, I hope I hope some of the content was was useful and and provide some insight, um, and uh, and I wish everyone well with their their graduation today and uh, and a very uh, so safe and and healthy summer. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, all right, so I I think we'll take a break until two fifteen. Um, I did want to remind, I don't think I uh, mentioned it at the beginning of the um, session here, but we are being recorded, and um, and, and at 2.15, we'll, we'll still continue to be recorded. Um, at 2.15, we'll come back, and Dr. Shotman will, um, will go ahead with our Pi Mu Epsilon Honor Society induction ceremony. Okay. So, um, everybody take a break, grab a coffee, grab something to eat, and um, then I'll see you back here again. Bob, thank you so, so much. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, I just wanted to remind you that we're still being recorded. Um, and so, I wanted to turn at this point, I wanted to turn it over to Dr. Shopman, who will uh, induct our new Pi Mu Epsilon students. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, Tara, excuse me, I'm looking at our list. Um, welcome. I hope everyone is doing well on this beautiful Friday afternoon. Um, at this time, what I would like to do is present our inductees for the Prime U Epsilon Honor Society. We're going to announce uh, two classes uh, because last year in 2020, we did not have the opportunity to have a ceremony. Um, those students were uh, informed of their admission to Pi Mu Epsilon at the time, but we didn't publicly recognize them. So I do have just a few slides that I want to share as I explain a little bit about Pi Mu Epsilon um, and then announce the inductees. So hope this works in just a moment. Uh, can you see the Time You Epsilon screen or it's not happening? No, we just see you. Not yet. Okay, we'll try that one more time. We're Here good. We go. We're good. Thank you. All right. So, 
what I'd like to just um, explain a little bit is that uh, we are the New Jersey Delta chapter of Pi Mu Epsilon. Uh, this chapter was granted a charter in 1968. Um, one of our founding charter members is Dr. Thomas Marlowe, who's currently on the call. There are currently over 300 chapters of Pi Mu Epsilon in the United States. The motto of Pi Mu Epsilon is to promote scholarship and mathematics. Um, I have a second slide that shows the shield for Pi Mu Epsilon and just a little bit of background information. As we all who are mathematicians on the call know the interval symbol in the upper left. Um, the violet flower is in the upper right because violet is one of the colors, as you can uh, see from the shield for Pi Mu Epsilon. The summation sign is again, as we all know, a mathematical symbol. And then the three stars on the lower left corner stand for fraternity, morality, and scholarship. As I mentioned, violet is the flower for the society, and the colors, as you can see from the shield, are violet, gold, and lavender. At this time, I have another slide, the final one, that lists our inductees from the two years last spring. Um, what I would like, and this spring, excuse me, what I would like if any of these students are on the call. I do know that some of them did contact me and had some uh, scheduling conflicts at this time. And I also know some of the students have graduated, um, so they may not be available to be on the call, but I wanted to make sure we acknowledge them. So uh, when your name is called, if you wouldn't mind putting your camera on, um, if you are present, because I would like when I name everyone to then have you recite a pledge. So I also would like you to unmute yourself as well. So from the spring of 2020, uh, Evan Ganning, Sarah Hutchinson, Brooke Mullen, John Mosaic, Johan Patapara, and Marie Sokol. Those were our inductees from last year. Um, our inductees this year are Lucas Klops, Donna D'Alessio, Annalisa Espona, and William Mole. And lastly, Elizabeth Pukas. Okay. Um, all of these students will be receiving Pi Mu Epsilon Journal. Um, I've also made arrangements for everyone to receive their certificate, honor cord, and PIN. Uh, they will be mailed uh, to your home addresses. So that's going to go on. And then before we do the pledge, one other thing. For those of you that have attended Pi Mu Epsilon's induction ceremonies in the past when we had them in person uh, there was a there's a ledger that we have had um, every inductee since the first charter the first ceremony sign um, and unfortunately given the circumstances we're currently in we can't do that um, but I did check with Pi Mu Epsilon and their bylaws and we are allowed to have a um, I guess uh, someone signed the ledger for the students. So uh, we're going to make arrangements um, for, I spoke to Melissa and her handwriting is much more legible than mine. So uh, she's going to assist me in having everyone's names put into the ledger for them so that there will be that uh, continuous record of all of our inductees. So at this time, I'll stop sharing my screen and if we could have the, oh, great. I see you all popped up on my screen. Very exciting. Um, okay, so the um, I will state portions of the pledge and if you could just repeat them after me, it's not very long. I solemnly promise that I will exert my best efforts. I see. Unmute yourself. I solemnly promise, I promise. I promise. I promise. I promise. best efforts. To promote true scholarship, particularly in mathematics. To promote to true promote scholarship, scholarship particularly in mathematics. mathematics. And that I will support the objectives of Pi Mu Epsilon. And, and, that, I and that I will support the objectives, the objectives of Pi Mu Epsilon. Epsilon. All right. Well, congratulations to one and all. You are now officially inducted as members of Pi Mu Epsilon. Um, as I mentioned, it's in uh, society that has great um, membership and over 300 charters within the U.S. So you're in a very elite crowd. Um, so again, my congratulations to you all.
Well, that concludes our induction ceremony for Pioneer Web Salons. Tara, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, congratulations to our new inductees. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to have our John J. Sackerman graduation awards. So this concludes our first segment. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for attending our first of our Peter Scheim events, and I hope everyone will join us for our second segment, which will be all of our math, computer science, and data science poster presentations. So just so we know that we're, where we're going, um, at 2.45, we'll come back. Uh, we'll come back to our teams uh, for this event, but it'll be a different link. So you should have gotten a second link um, for for our um, student poster presentations. Um, if any of you have any questions on where that link is, oh, Burke, thank you so much for posting it in our chat. Um, so if it's not on your calendar, Burke posted the link in our chat. Okay. Um, I hope everyone will enjoy, uh, everyone enjoyed the first part of our uh, Peter Scheim event, and I hope to see you guys for the second one at 2.45. All right. I'll see you soon.